Um, uh, absolute pleasure to have Dr. Leif Star uh, Karlstrom here, um, I, who I actually first with unknowingly met at Blue Waters Bluegrass Festival, because uh, Leif is actually a virtuoso fiddle player, um, actually got his, uh, an undergraduate at University of Oregon as fiddle, um, got an undergraduate in math and an undergraduate in physics, um, which is a, outstanding in its own right, um, but then went on to get his PhD um, at Caltech, um, working with Michael Manga. Or Berkeley, I'm sorry, at Berkeley, I'm working with Michael Manga, who actually is, I think, the only geology sort of folk person that has um, the MacArthur Grant or the, the uh, you know, sort of the Genius Grant Award. Um, and just knowing uh, Dr. Karlstrom just very loosely, I, it was just fantastic. His papers have come out on the Chief J Joseph Dyke Swarm and a whole multitude. Please check out his website um, and learn some more about his bands, musical endeavors, and the great papers that he's putting out. And so without further ado, thank you very much, Leif Carlstrom, for coming and talk about the Chief Joseph Dyke Swarm. Yeah. All right. Hey, thanks, Chad. Um, yeah. Uh, it's a very nice introduction. <laughs> um, yeah, hopefully I don't uh, I'm totally just disappoint here. Um, yeah, I, I guess um, I've actually never been to Eastern Washington University, but I hope to in person. I'm like everyone, I'm sure, um, just sick and tired of Zoom. But um, also, it's pretty nice in the sense that, like, you can interact with people over great distances. <laughs> um, and and so, yeah. So hopefully, there's a chance to come out and visit in person one of these days. Um, but uh, we'll we'll have to live with this for the moment. Um, yeah, I guess I'm gonna just give a I don't know, a, a rambling snapshot of current state of affairs um, in my research program here. Um, I've been at the University of Oregon for uh, about seven years now. Um, <clears throat> and that is about the duration of my <laughs> research on the, on the CRB. Um, I'll give it a little bit more sort of personal historic background as we go, but um, you know it's 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 a quite an intimidating place to do research because it's it's got such a long history and such a rich rich history of work by by some great great folks and it's really complicated. Um, uh, so so you know I st I still feel like I'm I'm learning the basics in some sense, but but we've made some contributions I hope and I'm pretty excited about the next steps too. It's certainly a, an area where I'm, I'm hoping to, to focus efforts for, for years to come. So um, yeah, I'm gonna give you, I guess, a, a few different little vignettes. Um, I will freely admit that this talk is gonna be sort of a mishmash of a few conference presentations and other things. So, um, you know, apologies if it's a little less than completely polished, but, um, you know, hopefully still works. So uh, Kendra Murray, um, Joe Biasi, Rachel Hampton, who's a, a current PhD student, Matthew Morris, who is a former PhD student, Ben Black, Pete Reiners, Tamsin Mather, and a whole host of others um, have been a part of this so far. And so, um, yeah, by no means am I responsible for everything that's going on here, but um all right, let's let's get started. So so basically, I'm going to sort of give you three three little mini mini talks, I guess, and there's there's relations between them, of course. But um, first, we'll kind of orient ourselves to flood basalts as a you know end member, perhaps, of volcanologic processes, sort of writ large, um, including the stuff that we see uh, today. Um, we'll then, of course, use the CRB as uh, or the Columbia River flood basalts as a um, you know, sort of example of, of perhaps things that we expect to see globally. Um, and that'll be kind of something that I'll, I'll dip in and out of. I was recently part of a sort of a review paper um, with Ben Black and Thames and Mather, where we actually really tried to um, say something, you know, kind of combing the literature in some sense um, about, about the, this notion of a life cycle of large igneous provinces globally that um, we can maybe apply to the CRB uh, in particular. And then I guess the last part um, of the talk will be maybe more specifically about the Chief Joseph and, and even maybe more specifically about a single dike <laughs> in the Chief Joseph that we've spent an enormous time, uh, amount of time working on and is uh, just getting 
richer and richer the more we look at it. So um, that that'll be all about how we estimate the dynamics of these um, massive eruptions from the frozen geologic record of, of dikes. Okay. Um, and so I guess I'll probably, you know, I, I don't done enough of these Zoom talks at this point to sort of feel like, yeah, on, on the one hand, um, it's it's nice to hold off on questions. As I, I would, if I was in person, I actually very much appreciate getting erupt, interrupted. <laughs> um, but if if you, you know, I, we can still sort of do that. Actually, if you put questions in the chat, um, I will try to be fairly cognizant of of that. Um, if if you want to type them in, and then of course at the end we can we can do that as well. So, but but um, yeah, this is very much meant to be sort of as interactive as it can can be given that. So, um, all right so let's let's start so so i guess i'm not really assuming that people know much about large igneous provinces so i'm kind of going to give a, a an overview these things are um you know sort of the biggest volcanic events in the geologic record and there's many of them um and so uh, all kinds of reasons why they're fascinating, right? They, they, they provide a, um, a window into sort of global geodynamics, right? These things are tapping deep reservoirs in the deep mantle, perhaps core mantle boundary. Um, they uh, are, play a big role in plate tectonics, plate tectonic evolution. Um, and they happen to be well correlated with most of, or many of the largest mass extinctions of life that we know about. Um, and so this is a plot from a, a paper um, by Cordelot Rennie in um, 2003, uh, showing this sort of kind of astounding, like one-to-one -one, um, correlation between the age of mass extinctions and the age of continental flood basalts or oceanic plateaus, right? And so we have a lot of these here, like in Permian, um, you know, we have the Deccan and Cretaceous, that's the extinction of the dinosaurs and so forth. Um, there's one associated with the Columbia uh, as well, this mid Miocene climate optimum um, and associated much smaller extinction event. Um, but yeah, mostly I'm going to focus on continental flood basalts today. Um, this is sort of a lot of various things um, in here, but uh, Columbia River flood basalts is an example of, of one of these things that um, we see all over the globe, punctuating geologic history over the Phanerozoic, at least, and going back much farther as well. Um, just, you know, snapshot of that, maybe spatially, um, you can just sort of see how widespread these things are, I guess, is, is sort of the, the notion. And, and also, you know, the, the enormous extent, this is a global map, and these things are, are you know, significant sort of geologic units on that global scale. Um, we have lots of them in the ocean, we have lots of them in the continents, and we also have these things that are more and more well recognized. I won't really talk about this aspect of it, but um, you know, the, the name basalt is in the name <laughs> um, but for, uh, of, of these events, but, but it's increasingly recognized that there's often a silicic component um, and some of them are purely silicic. So Sierra Madre, Oxide, and Tal, these things sometimes are called Ignin bright flare-ups and maybe associated with different tectonic events, but um, these enormous outpourings of magma um, span the compositional range, oceanic, continental, often associated with deep mantle processes. Mantle plumes, for example. Um, <clears throat> as we get better at dating things, <laughs> um, this again is, is maybe coming back to the, the environmental crisis um, connection. Uh, it's it's really quite remarkable, basically, as, as geochronology um, gets better and better, we more or less see a progressive narrowing in, in the gap between large igneous provinces and major mass extinctions. Um, this plot here is from a really recent review um, by Kasbaum and others, and it's more or less showing, you know, right, here's here's the, the duration of the, or the, the event, um, environmental crisis, mass extinction, large scale climatic perturbation, et cetera. And then the duration, the span of the large igneous province relative to that. Um, another way of, of more or less looking at that plot that I showed on the previous slide of the one-to-one -one, here is more or less just showing how far off are we from that one-to-one -one, and then the duration of the, the, um, the event as well, right? 
Um, so first, th first thing to, to notice is that everything clusters around zero, and that's that's really cool and really interesting, um, more or less. As our dates get better, everything gets you know compressed more and more, and so it's clear that there's some relationship here. We're still trying to tease out exactly what it is and what the me mechanisms are. Um, but the other point, of course, is that um, the the x scale here is time in millions of years, and and so this is also making the point that um, large igneous provinces often last much longer than the environmental crises by, by millions of years, right? So these are major, major events. Um, and so, so that, that tells us that this is, this is a more complex and nuanced story, um, geologic story. And so, um, yeah, a couple of the things that we want to know, right? Um, I would say from my standpoint, I, I, I'm kind of have my toes dipped in a bunch of different pots in the volcanology world. Um, and I want to know in what ways are, are uh, large igneous provinces part of a spectrum of magmatic processes generally, right? So can I use a study of, of historic events and things that I can like go take videos of or whatnot um, to, uh, to understand these, these things that happened millions of years ago? Um, here, of course, is the, the CRBG, the Columbia River. Flood basalt is our youngest um, and actually smallest large igneous province on the planet. Um, we're gonna use that as sort of like exemplar for the, for the whole suite of these things, because I guess I'm gonna argue that we think that, that there is some commonalities to these, these big events. Okay, just a little bit <clears throat> more background here. If we think sort of on large scale, the duration of these large igneous provinces is sort of common in the, commonly in the sort of five to 15 million year range. Um, commonly there's multiple pulses, uh, we call these things sometimes formations. Um, each of those would have many, many eruptions associated with it. Um, and that's sort of showing on the left here, a compilation of the occurrence of, of these large igneous provinces um, and some sort of estimate of the number of pulses. Uh, this is, of course, getting more refined as the geochronology and mapping get better. And so this, this sort of actually is a little bit out of date. It's 2008 compilation here. Um, in terms of rates of processes, right? Here's maybe motivated again by the Columbia River flood basalts. Um, this notion that they're anomalous melt mantle melting events. So if we think of them um, as, as the result of a mantle plume causing sort of a widespread decompression melting in the mantle, um, that is predicted to have a, a, a quite long sort of characteristic time scale on the order of say 10 million uh, years or so. However, many of these events, especially as the geochronology gets better, um, get sort of much more compressed in time. So the CR, uh, CRB here um, is, has, a, has a sort of like eruption flux curve or like rate of magnetism curve that looks quite a bit different than what you might expect from say a, a plume head. And, um, and that would be true for any kind of mantle melting uh, event. Um, I'm not going to talk about this. Of course, there's debate about the exact mechanisms by which you generate these things, but sort of anything driven from the mantle is going to have this long time scale. And oftentimes, flood basalts are much more compressed. Okay. And so that's interesting. That's like a big first order observation that's common to, to many large igneous provinces that we can try to interrogate um, and ask about are, are there mechanisms that we can identify to explain it. <laughs> Okay, um, right, of course, this is our, our Columbia River flood basalt. I'm sure you know, you've all seen this graph in one form or another um, at some point in your lives. Uh, <laughs> it's in our backyard. I suppose you live right in it. Um, I do not, I live over here in the Willamette Basin, but uh, it's pretty close. I can, you know, I can drive up and see some CRB um, you know, near Salem, <laughs> um, stuff that, that came all the way from Northeast Oregon and its source region um, down the Paleo Columbia River, all the way out into the ocean. Um, really spectacular, long, long lava flows. Um, this is a large igneous province that erupted between, you know, roughly 17 million years and six, six million years. So, so, so spot on that kind of characteristic 10 million year duration that's common to other things. Um, CRB is complex. I'm not really going to go into all the complexities. It's likely associated with the initiation of the Yellowstone hotspot track, which of course is active today. Um, it may also, and I don't have a picture of this, but um, you know, recent work is sort of suggesting that it actually may be part of a, even a much longer history um, associated with the Silesia terrain, um, and which might have been a mantle plume um, off the, in the Pacific Ocean that created a, um, a big oceanic plateau prior to this. Um, that's, that's a really interesting story. Some neat papers I could point, point folks to um, on that that have come out recently. 
Um, but you know, more or less, this is this is what we're dealing with. Um, this huge outpouring of of mafic lavas um, between seventeen and six million years. Um, <clears throat> how is it distributed? Well, you know, being that this thing is is fairly recent in the sort of geologic scheme of things um, and well exposed. Uh, you know, there's just been a tremendous amount of work on this. And so we actually have the sort of highest resolution picture of, of how this thing was in place, um, you know, of any flood basalt province on earth. And, and so here's a, here's a compilation by Barry et al. Um, 2013, that's, that's sort of breaking down, you know, not only at the sort of formation level, this Steens, Grand Ronde, Picture Gorge, um, but also sort of at a much more granular level, especially looking at the, the, the younger side of things. These are all, I guess, what people will call Saddle Mountains formation. Um, and, and, and you can see that it's, you know, it's quite variable actually when you look at time. Um, but then if you look at volume, uh, right, it's the log scale on the left and the linear scale on the inset there. Um, the Grand Rod is, this, is, is the main contributor, right? The, the entire province um, erupted about 210 thousand cubic kilometers of magma um you know as a comparison mount st helens was one <laughs> so this is big um and the vast majority of it about 75 percent of it is the grand run and so here's what it's been mapped as there on the right um, we actually have you know quite a bit of inf information on a sub formation level um, I showed that picture of the, the Saddle Mountains on the previous slide. This is looking at the, the Grand Ronde. So this is the, um, you know, that main phase here uh, broken down by member. Um, and, and so you can sort of see like, this is an enormous amount of work. I guess I'd like to sort of emphasize that, right? That the areas that we're talking about are large. These rocks all kind of look the same. <laughs> Uh, which I'm sure you're uh, aware of. And so, so, you know, it's just an incredible amount of detailed mapping and analyses that are required to refine this. And so this has gone on over the last sort of 50, 60 years, um, at least. Um, and, but we now have the benefit of, of having this record and we can, we can start to interrogate it, right? So um, waning phase here, I'm talking about the Saddle Mountains. And you can see that, you know, if we go from inception of this event on the left to the end on the right, it's getting more variable in terms of the, um, the volume of, of individual members. And so that's kind of an interesting thing, right? From the standpoint of, of placing this in the spectrum of, of volcanic processes, for example. Um, the, uh, that's a piece of, piece of information that we can, we can begin to interrogate. Um, of course, the individual volumes of these things are enormous. Um, and again, you sort of reference our, you know, Mount St. Helens or whatever, even Mount Mazama, our, our sort of large scale um, cascades eruption would only be at sort of 50 cubic kilometers. So, so you know, smaller than the vast majority of, of these, these units. Um, and so that's, that tells us that something is, is a little bit different, <laughs> perhaps, um, about these flood basalt eruptions than, than things that we're used to seeing. In fact, we have no historic analog, really, of a flood basalt eruption. Okay, um, this is from our recent review paper where we tried to sort of put everything together to the best of our abilities, um, looking at sort of um, the, the eruptive flux, um, the timing of these events, and the, the chemistry of them. And so this is more or less showing, you know, sort of similar things, but um, but all in all in one place. And I think the thing to, to, to emphasize about this, so each, each, each sort of vertical panel here is plotting something a little bit different, except for the less, the left two, which are plotting the same thing. Um, they're plotting a sort of a formation average in the red um, lines, the formation, formation average eruption rate, cubic kilometers per year, and then the cumulative volume here um, on the bottom axis. Um, and what's I think uh, of note here is on the left panel, we're plotting age. On the y-axis and on the right um, most panel here uh, of, of these two we're looking at the cumulative lava thickness sort of stratigraphic height um, and i guess this is just to sort of uh, emphasize again right that the vast majority of the the emplacement this grand ron formation happened in a very short amount of time um, and and the you know best best sort of geochronology at this stage is putting the grand ron at at sort of four hundred thousand years um, or so, so quite a bit less than a million years. And that's really remarkable, right? That's, that's less than 10% of the whole um, duration of the province. And so that, that poses us a, a challenge, right? So how can we explain, explain this? And I do not have an answer to it now, but it's something I'm working on as
as our others. Okay, um, <clears throat> but to sort of zoom out a little bit, uh, I think this this might provide one way to to uh, to begin a discussion of of what's going on here. And this is again from this review paper that we put together, um, trying to sort of make sense of of large igneous province uh, observations globally. And so so the notion is that uh, CRB um, is is helping to define this picture as as is other things. And there's quite a lot of stuff on here, and so I'm going to kind of walk through it a little bit. Um, what you're basically looking at on the left, I guess, is um, is a is a cross section, sort of like a cartoon, if you like, um, from the mantle to the surface, um, where we're trying to sort of understand the spatial patterning, uh, the flux of magma, the flux of volatiles. Right, these are the things that are going to cause the climate um, impacts and also drive eruption dynamics. Um, and so th they're a really crucial um, part of the story. That's I, I would say maybe one of the more new new developments in in LIP research is a real focus on the volatile budgets. Um, we also are uh, trying to constrain the, the the sort of plumbing system of these, like where is magma stored in the crust, what volumes. Um, and so that's on here too, these notions that this is a, a sort of prolonged magma transport, um, sis, uh, long lived magma transport system that's sort of emplacing these magma chambers, they're cooling and crystallizing, they're getting sort of overprinted by others. Um, but that over sort of millions of years time scales, um, there's some net evolution here. Um, looking at sort of the aerial extent of these as a, a measure perhaps of, of, of similarity in process, you can sort of see this area in uh, kilometers, uh, there sort of a, a spatial dimension. Um, and you can see the CRB compared to the, the Siberian traps there, which is our largest one. Chief Joseph Dyke Swarm is a sort of the thing that I'm gonna talk about in a bit, our, our window into the plumbing system here in the CRB. Um, but it's, you know, you can compare that to other um, things that may reflect similar processes, scare guard, layered mafic intrusion in, in Greenland, um, the Sealands, uh, magmatic province um, in, in, in Norway. Uh, there's a, a lot of stuff that we can start to look at that might constrain, you know, use the sort of classic geologic uh, procedure of a sort of a space for time kind of <laughs> argument, looking at exhumed ancient um, provinces as a proxy for what might be um, under the, the sort of CRB now that we can't see, for example. Okay, um, Chief Joseph Dyke Swarm, Columbia River flood basalts. Here are just a couple of things, right? We can constrain the um, the, the the spatial structure of of the crust as you know it's been uh, left as a record for us uh, with seismology, and so people like Gene Humphreys and others um, have have spent essentially their careers trying to refine seismic pictures of the CRB. And, and, and now we can sort of say, in fact, we, we do have some evidence that they're deep in the crust here is, um, you know, quite a bit of magma that was frozen. Um, we're probably never going to see it with our, with our eyes, but we can, we can sort of infer it with the seismic velocities that, that you see there, right? So this is that red zone. I'm, I'm sort of putting an arrow towards this. This is uh, the lower crust um, in a seismic image published in 2017 that's sort of showing this higher than average seismic velocity. Um, and, and we we think that that's consistent with, with intrusions because um, these velocities more or less, the only way that you can produce them is with olivine and pyroxene cumulates, um, which would be the, um, the result of, of cooling and crystallizing magma. So sort of anomalously uh, dense material that gives rise to fast seismic velocities. And that's sitting right underneath the Chief Joseph Dyke Swarm um, that we see at the surface here. So um, kind of a neat little constraint. The Chief Joseph Dyke Swarm looks a little bit like this. <laughs> it's a picture I showed on the, on, on the, on the front slide. Um, these massive dikes um, here, and that's a person, person for scale, that are the sort of direct evidence of magma uh, pumping through the crust in this case. Um, <clears throat> other constraints, right? Um, this is now a little bit more general than the CRB, but, but a lot of the data, as you'll see, comes from the CRB. Um, these are, are sort of our, our best cut at using petrology. Um, so using these uh, uh, clinopyroxene minerals as little barometers 
that that tell us their crystallization depth. Um, and because we know the position of, of the erupted lavas in the sort of progression of these LIPs, we can now start to say, are there patterns in the crystallization depths between you know, early erupted magmas, main phase, things like the Grand Ron, and then late stage. Um, and, and in fact, there, there kind of are, I mean, it's, it's messy and, and it, it's an imperfect technique, but um, for example, in the CRB, you see sort of deep stuff at the beginning, an expansion of these, these crystallization depths throughout the crust in the main phase, um, and then, and then sort of a similar, uh, but perhaps larger concentration of, of, of storage in the lower crust with a lot more variability in the late, late phase. Um, and so that's, that's more or less what we're using to sort of constrain this notion of a life cycle, um, that there's, there seems to be a progression in, in large igneous provinces globally. So here we have Siberian traps, here we have the Emishan um, in China, um, as other, other examples where we have data. Um, that, that constrain this, this sort of overall phenomenology that um, intrusions are sort of confined to the lower crust, perhaps because, uh, you know, this is sort of a, a crustal strength curve here. We have brittle ductal transition um, implied there in that kink of the line, that thing sort of expands um, throughout the crust as we're dumping tons of heat into the crust and sort of making it more mushy during the main phase. And then it sort of uh, relaxes back to something more normal in the late phase. So a notion that the, the crust itself can be quite dynamic if you're dumping all of this magma into it. And that might be in fact, what's controlling some of the big large scale sort of uh, patterns and eruptive flux that, that we see. Okay, so we, we're constraints, constraints on the depths of melting and the range of crustal um, storage. <clears throat> Okay, uh, volatiles, this is the other piece of the, the, the puzzle. And so, so we get constraints on volatiles by looking at things like melt inclusions. So here's a, um, an example from uh, a thin section here of a melt inclusion in the olivine crystal um, where it's trapped a little bit of a vapor actually into these, these little melt inclusions as the crystals were, were sort of first forming. Um, and we can now interrogate those little melt inclusions um, which actually, you know, provide sort of an outstanding record of the gases that otherwise are just sort of fluxing through the system. So there's both these sort of crystal um, records and also bubble records that are locked into the crystals, um, which are providing sort of a really outstanding um, way to, to study uh, the volatile flux. And there's other, other techniques as well. Um, the volatiles that we see largely probably come from the plume head, but also from this, this region called the continental lithospheric mantle, um, which is being recognized as sort of a very enriched zone that might have sort of large reservoirs of volatiles trapped on geologic timescales that might get liberated by uh, large igneous province magmas. Okay, so this is chlorine as an example, CO2 being the main climate driver we're interested in. Um, there's, uh, you know, a large flux from the mantle. Uh, it turns out that there's also probably a large flux from, um, uh, thermal metamorphism of the crust. So magmas intruding, uh, carbonates, for example, um, super widespread in the Siberian traps. Um, perhaps this is the reason that we have the largest mass extinction of life on earth associated with the Siberian traps. Um, the huge amount of CO2 that was liberated from the crust, um, we also have have carbonates in the Columbia Basin, right? And so this is this is a you know, little bit less of a lesser of extent in Siberia, but um, but is, is is something that that's worth considering for the CRB as well. Um, okay, and so so I guess this notion that the storage evolves through the course of uh, large igneous province life cycle also implies that the volatile flux evolves over the course of the large igneous province life cycle. And um, people have started to sort of investigate this notion that, that actually some of the volatile flux might come from the intrusions um, as well as the eruptions. And so, so it's a little bit more complicated in some sense because the eruptions you have this direct record of, the lavas came out, the intrusions you don't, but they may be much longer lived because they sit in the crust uh, insulated by the rocks rather than um, cooling directly to the atmosphere. So some, some kind of new developments in this, in this realm. <clears throat> okay, why is that important? Well, here's the CRB again. Um, here's the mid-Miocene climate optimum um, as, as you know, given by say, for example, Delta 18O um, <clears throat> proxies, and it overlaps right with the, the main phase. Um, and so we'd like to, to understand the dynamics of the magma transport. So that eventually we can put constraints on the volatile flux 
and hopefully um, uh, hopefully get get a sense of the uh, progression of of the climate catastrophes that happen here. Um, this is largely going to be, however, below the resolution of geochronology. <laughs> right? um, if we look at one particular member, here's the Wapshilla Ridge, uh, the largest member in the CRB. Um, our state-of-the-art geochronology, you know, our, our high-precision uranium lead dating, um, likely will never have resolution uh, to, to really put constraints on the duration of this particular event. So if you wanted to know, you know for example, CO2 flux associated with that thing, um, you're probably not going to get there with, uh, with geochronology. And so you kind of have to come up with other, other ways. Um, and so that's, that's, that'll lead us into this other part of the talk here, um, where we're now going to sort of try to develop some techniques um, to, to assess the, the duration of large igneous province um, eruptions, um, individual events that are below the level of, of geochronology. And we're going to do that by, by examining uh, a, um, a fairly unique, I would say, exposure that we have, direct exposure of the plumbing system here. Um, that's the Chief Joseph Dykes one in Northeast Oregon. Um, this is a sort of a very crude cartoon of which you will see many in the literature <laughs> um, of, of these, these dikes um, here from Cobble and the Hood. But just to give you a, a, a sort of overall picture of, of how these things relate to the other structures that we're interested in here. So, so suggestively here, you know, CRB connecting up to the Yellowstone, Yellowstone hotspot, um, but then also going north, the largest outcroppings of feeder dikes that we have are actually in Northeast Oregon, which is displaced from the, the hotspot track um, for reasons that are not entirely well understood here. But the notion is that the source region for most of the CRB actually is sort of Northeast Oregon, um, <clears throat> perhaps south of the Wallowa Mountains, perhaps the Wallowa Mountains, um, not really known. Okay. Um, the, the data set that I'm going to talk about is, uh, once again, I'm sort of like standing on the shoulders of giants kind of thing. Um, here's, this is uh, the life's work in some sense of, of a scientist by the name of Bill Taubenek, um, who's a former professor at Oregon State University. Um, he spent, uh, you know, the, the greater part of his career um, in the field studying feeder dikes and, and, and their relation to the host rock. Uh, more than 50 years, more or less going out every single summer to the Wallawas and to Northeast Oregon and, and, and Southeast Washington, often by himself, mostly by himself, <laughs> um, tramping around and, and, and making measurements. And um, tragically, in some sense, he, um, he died before he could make any of this public. And, and so actually it was right when I first started at, at the U of O um, or, right, or shortly thereafter, um, a, a woman by the name of Anita Grunder, who's at also a professor at OSU, um, sent around this email sort of saying, you know, Bill Talvinek recently died. We are, you know, cleaning out his office. I found these boxes of notebooks. Um, I know what's in them, but I do not have time to go uh, dig through it. Um, does anyone want to? Um, and I said, sure. Uh, and so, so got a hold of, you know, this box. And there was also many maps. Um, that you know, each of these notebooks is a year. So there's about 50 notebooks filled up with his um, <laughs> his observations, which you know um, are an amazing read. Actually, you too could check out these notebooks. They are in fact archived at the Whitman Library, so not not so far from you, actually. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so they they are you know will be preserved for the future generation. We scanned them all, um, and so that's what we use. But the physical copies are are there at the Whit Whitman Library and. And uh, you know, you want to see the record of a great geologist. Um, this is a this is a good resource. Um, fun to fun to take a look at. There's a lot more stuff in here, of course, that we we did not pull out. Um, for example, what Bill uh, um, ate for lunch during his field days. Um, <laughs> all kinds of things like this. Uh, but also just some amazing amazing measurements. Um, wide ranging, sort of complete geologic observations. Um, what we are most interested in are these dikes okay and so you can sort of see on this map here uh, in this case uh whitman national forest uh he he mapped these structures um and if anyone's you know hiked in the Wallowa mountains you know how how rugged it is so this is actually a fairly fairly impressive um, data set each one of these things is a record of of his you know often solo trips um for for weeks or months on end out into the Wallowas, making these observations and um 
And that's going to be the basis of, of uh, a, a bunch of analysis. We have a couple of papers out on these things and, and there's more in the works. Um, of course he died sort of before I had a chance to meet him. <laughs> um, and, and so we're left with a bit of a, a conundrum, right? That, that we have to sort of interpret his, his observations um, and, and make sense of them. And they're not always, it's not always straightforward to do this. First thing we, of course, we wanted to do is, is, is make sure we understood his maps. And so, so this was the first part of our work here where we were largely, you know, after trying to field check these, these maps and just sort of make sure that what was on there made sense to us. Um, and, and I was a part of the uh, U of O field camp for a couple of years. And, and we took this on actually as a, as a bit of a field camp project that um, we would go and, and, and try to find his dikes <laughs> and, and make our own measurements and, and see whether they matched up with his. And, and to, you know, this is not even close to all of them. <laughs> and, and of course we found many that, that, that don't match up, um, but largely they do. Um, and so it's, it's a nice, nice sort of check. And, you know, as a piece of legacy data, I would say very, very carefully done, um, such that like somebody could come after, after he died and piece it back together. Um, this was the work of, of myself and PhD student, um, Matthew Morris and, and a really great undergraduate named Morgan Nashville, Nashville who, who did all the digitizing, um, it's a pretty significant effort actually. Uh, but so for example, here's 2016, we looked at 33 dikes, <laughs> um, in the Willow mountains and grand Ron river Canyon. Um, you know, here's tunnel dike. If anyone's ever, one, ever been there, there's a, a road drilled through this thing on the grand Ron river. Um, this is, this one's actually in, in Washington. I think the rest of these are in Oregon. Um, okay. So this is, this is sort of what we get. Um, this is, this is a paper, uh, published a couple of years ago by Morris. I should actually, this is a little bit old now, Morris et al. is in fact published um, and, and contains this figure, which is more or less a summary of, of all the dikes in that data set. And there's about 4,000 um, dikes that, that Taubeneck mapped. Um, and they're, you know, sort of, I would say, far and away the best record of, of, of a flood basalt um, plumbing system that we, that we have. Um, here's their distribution. Here's their orientations. Um, they paint a quite a bit more complex picture actually than I think was previously recognized. Um, I would say, you know, from, I'll just sort of skip back a couple of slides, right? Like this, um, you get this notion that the flood basalt dikes of the Columbia river, um, you know, more or less have a sort of like North South um, uh, kind of orientation. They're distributed in this way. And what we found from Taubenex measurements is, is that it's, it's, Yes, I mean there is a, a north-south trend here. So this is this is down here on the bottom is a, a rose diagram of the sort of like a histogram, if you like, an angular histogram of the orientations. And yes, it's dominantly sort of um, north-northwest, um, south-southeast. But uh, you know, if you look in detail, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So you know, the Lakes Basin, for example, in the Wallowa is um, pretty dang complex. Cornucopia to the south of the Wallowa is also. Quite complex. There's a number of regions actually that sort of suggest that this is you now there's some stuff going on here that is 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 a little bit um, maybe not quite as as straightforward as as maybe it was once once thought. Um, this this left one is Maxwell Lake, and I'm gonna I'm gonna hop into there shortly. Um, <clears throat> in fact, right here. So so basically, we're gonna take this whole uh, distribution of dikes, zoom in a little bit. Here's the Wallowas. You can see a little bit better here what the um, complexities that that Taubenex data sort of um, show us. We have yet to make sense of this. This is sort of one of my active research projects is, is you know, thinking about the swarm at the swarm scale. What does this mean? And I'm not going to talk anything about that today, but it's sort of coming up. Um, but what we have done is we've looked at this one, we've want, looked at this one dike, <laughs> um, the Maxwell Lake dike, which is that blue star. Um, it's Lee dike as well, but I'm all focused on the, the, on the Maxwell Lake dike. And this is, um, actually has, has, has been a really useful uh, place, both for some sort of method development to connect to the sort of rates, rates of eruption questions that I mentioned earlier, and also a, a bit of an eye opener, I would say, into how complex these things really are. So I'll walk through that. Here's the Maxwell Lake Dyke Complex. Very beautiful. It's a bit of a hike to get up here. Um, it's actually a very popular trail up the Lustine Canyon. Um, you too can do it. Uh, 
you have to more or less go uh, straight up for four miles <laughs> up the side of this, this Lost Teen Canyon, which is over there on the left. But then you get to this beautiful lake um, and right across that lake is, is this massive dike. In fact, you can sort of uh, actually can't really see it too well. Um, but it has been studied. So this is why we chose this one as a, as a starting point. Um, Petkovich and Grunder, Anita Grunder again, um, had a really nice paper in Journal of Petrology, uh, 2003, where they went up and, and mapped uh, a portion of this dike and recognized that uh, around the dike, there were these baked zones, sort of a, sort of a thermal metamorphism um, that uh, varied in a systematic way. That if you looked at the, you know, the, the minerals in thin section that you'd see, or even just texturally in hand sample, um, you could identify these, these zones. Um, and from that, they sort of inferred uh, that there was a heating of the wall rocks, perhaps maybe as one would expect, right? You're pumping all this uh, magma into the shallow crust, it's gonna heat it up. But, but a neat thing that one can ask from that is that, well, the width of that heating um, is a direct record in some sense of the duration of the magma flow. And that suggests kind of some neat things that one can do. Um, this is also an interesting place because as it turns out, the composition of this dike overlaps with Wapshiller Ridge pretty well. So this is probably a feeder dike for the largest unit in, in the Grand Ronde, that 40,000 cubic kilometer unit. Um, we have since refined this quite a bit. I'm not gonna show any of that data because they make it a little bit more complex story. <laughs> there may be more than one number uh, that pumped through this structure. I'll get to that in a second, but but this previous work sort of suggests that this thing was likely a, a, a major feeder dike for one of the largest units. Um, and so it's it's a good place to, to focus these efforts on, on thinking about durations, again, below the, the um, levels of geochronology here. Um, we can also sort of ask questions more generically about dike mechanics. Right? I'm just going to throw these slides up here because these are also sort of open questions in the field of volcanology, right? Like how do dikes um, work? You know, they're, they're sort of magma filled hydraulic fractures, right? It's one way to think about them. Um, and there's lots of models. There's a lot of observations. Columbia River flood basalts is a great place to study some of these things, right? So are they dominated by buoyancy? Um, what can we say about the sort of segmentation, what that tells us about the sort of stress field, the external stress field that might be um, kind of guiding the, the dike emplacement. Um, and, and we can do that with, with uh, detailed structural observations. And so this is again, partially field camp and partially our own field campaigns. Um, this is sort of just a, a very messy compilation of, of a, a number of measurements where we've gone out and looked at sort of mapping structurally the boundaries of this dike over sort of a much larger area than the Petkovich and Grunder um, uh, study. We've done a whole lot of other stuff too. Um, there's uh, we'll talk about a bunch of paleomagnetic uh, measurements, some thermochronology, oxygen isotopes we've done. We've gotten geochemical transects. <laughs> Um, so there's a tremendous amount of data actually that's that's coming out of this area and um, hopefully we'll tell a, a pretty neat story. Um, that's me, I guess, walking over this dike. That's um, an undergraduate. Um, and let's see uh, what to say about this. Here's, here's a map as far as we can tell of what this thing looks like. And it is not simple. It's, it's a three-dimensional feature. Um, here's Maxwell Lake. Here's the trailhead. There's a big ridge. Clearly there's some an echelon segmentation of this, this um, dike. It comes in and out. You, can't, you can really identify it quite well in some areas and less well in others. Um, if you look closely at the margins, you see some evidence for mechanical erosion as well as that sort of baking, um, which is telling you that you know, this, is, this is sort of a, a, a pretty complex place actually. <laughs> um, but you know, overall it does paint this picture of a, you know, a north, Northeast, uh, striking structure. Um, and what we've now gone through and, and map done sort of the Petkovich and Grunder act, uh, activity of, of looking at the, the sort of reset zone or the baked zone along this. And, and it seems to be pretty consistent with some spatial variability that I think is quite interesting. Um, probably there's more than one segment happening here. These are three-dimensional structures, some of which have like more like sills actually than dikes. Um, so this is the dip of segments that we've come up with. Um, there's also all kinds of very sort of 
variation at, in strike at small scale, and that's the mechanical erosion. So you see like sort of a, a hollowing out of the baked country rocks. Um, and so we basically want to use this whole system to investigate dike segment longevity and the, the sort of duration of the whole event. Um, so that'll be sort of the last part of my talk here. Um, I'm not going to sort of jump into this the couple of methods that we've been throwing at this. So we, we have the structural measurements um, that we've made. We're more or less going to focus now, you know, we haven't, this is, this is like work in progress. Um, the stuff that we have developed is more or less focused on this thing that we're going to call the Jackson Lake segment down here. Um, and a little bit the Maxwell Lake segment up there, um, label on this plot. Uh, the, uh, these things are, are, fairly sort of simple structures and allow us to um, kind of apply a couple of state-of-the-art um, uh, geothermometers to this. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Um, this is going back to the Petkovich and Grunder study and sort of the motivation for our work. They did some phase equilibria, um, looking at where, you know, um, horn, brand, horn blend breaks down as a function of temperature and where biotite breaks down and where those minerals pop in to the, the host rock here, like on this plot on the top left, the dike is, uh, you know, here between zero and four meters, and the host rock is here um, going to the right. You see the texture observations in terms of the sort of partial melt extent, and then their, their um, uh, phase equilibria temperature constraints, which are then matched by a thermal model that they're doing. Okay, so this is, this was sort of a great template for us because uh, we want to, you know, both improve upon the modeling that's you know something that I that I do and work on, um, but then also incorporate new new data. <clears throat> okay, and so so this is an example of a thermal model, more or less, that's taking sort of a you know two dimensional picture of or I guess think of one dimensional in some sense um, distance across the the dike here, um, and then you sort of have to impose how long you think it was hot, uh, but then it sort of relaxes away over time. Okay, so you have a very sort of steep square pulse like uh, initial temperature that then smears out over time due to thermal diffusion. Um, and it's that propagation of that temperature signal that we're interested in capturing because that constrains the duration, right? So this, is, this was some initial work that suggests about three years of active flow duration based on this phase equilibria constraint, okay. Um, but, but, you know, there's a lot of variation predicted by the thermal histories uh, in the lower temperatures and these are high temperature constraints. Um, so that's where we come in. We're going to use low temperature uranium thorium helium thermochronology. Um, and this is sort of leveraging the uh, radioactive clocks that exist in um, appetite and zircon grains, um, <clears throat> where uh, you're sort of looking at alpha decay, helium diffusion um, in, in these grains. Uh, you get sort of, it's the, yeah, I guess it's the uranium thorium uh, system bro broadly. And so you're producing, um, helium atoms at temperatures below the closure temperature. Um, those things just accumulate, right? And so the longer, uh, a, a rock sample is, um, sitting around at, at low temperatures, the higher the helium contents. But at some point, if you heat it up, for example, here, if it's, you get a big spike in temperature as a function of time, you will release those helium atoms. You will open the crystal clocks and let them diffuse away, um, but sometimes not completely. So there's this kind of notion that you can sort of partially reset um, appetite and zircon grains. And that partial resetting uh, is, is the important thing that allows us to place constraints on the spatial variation of the, the time temperature path um, for, uh, for the system. Okay, and so this is, this is the data that we get. Um, just focus on the left one. This is the Maxwell Lake Dyke. That's the um, one that, that I was showing in that previous plot. Um, this is showing two different data sets, appetite, helium, and zircon. And what you're seeing is uh, very close to the dike contact here at zero, um, the predicted age of these systems by counting up the helium grains or helium atoms is, um, is about exactly the CRB emplacement age. Uh, very far away, it's the pluton crystallization age, about 120 million years. In between, you get this partial reset zone. And so that's telling you that heat was propagating out and liberating some of the helium atoms, but not all. We can model that. Um, and the two different systems, appetite and zircon, have different closure temperatures. Here's the appetite here on the bottom, the zircon on the top. And so we now have two different temperature points that we can match with models. 
here's a model. <laughs> I'll skip over that. Um, we can essentially model how uh, active the dike was in terms of its, its sort of duration of heating versus time. And um, we can also sort of constrain something about the composition. So we have different melt fraction temperature curves for the basalt and the granite host rocks. Um, and this allows us to sort of develop a pretty sort of like statistical approach where we can vary the durations, we can vary the steadiness of the dike um, sort of thermal history and ask, can we constrain the duration of, of magma flow? Um, we're gonna use a Bayesian inversion to do this. You can skip over some of this stuff. I'm happy to talk about it later if you like, but um, this more or less gives us an, a, a tool to sort of pose a bunch of different forward models, calculate residuals of those forward models from the data, and then in a probabilistic sense, ask, right, can we reconstruct a probability density function of, of a model given the data um, using this sort of uh, MCMC approach where we're kind of iteratively jiggling the model parameters. There's many of them that we're going to sort of try to, to vary a lot of unknowns in this problem. Um, ultimately, we want to come upon a, a solution, but it's not going to be a precise solution because the parameters trade off. And so we'll find that, you know, some populations of parameters with other populations of other parameters give us a good fit. And it's that joint PDF that will be the thing of interest. Um, for our case, it's a six dimensional parameter space where you want to constri um, constrain flow parameters, um, the far field background temperature, activation energies for helium diffusion and rock thermal conductivity. Um, we can fit the data pretty well. Just again, just look at the top ones. This is the Maxwell Lake dike. We're, we're fitting the zircon data and the appetite data. Um, and then this is kind of the, the neat one, right? Here's, here's the resulting PDF. So we can sort of say, well, here's what the duration of our dike is um, in a probabilistic sense where we acknowledge that there's uncertainty in the other parameters. Okay. So more or less, this tells us in a slightly more nuanced way how much we can actually learn from, from the dike. Um, so I'd say it's quite a bit more powerful than the Petkovich and Grunder. Um, a little bit more effort needed to <laughs> dive into the details here. Um, but uh, suffice to say, this is sort of, a, I, I would say, a pretty exciting result. Um, gives us ages that are longer, actually, than the, the Petkovich and, and Grunder case, about three to six uh, years. So that's, that's an estimate for the duration of the, this, this thing. Um, OK, I'm now going to blow by you with a, another one of these things that's, that we're going to um, use to get one more constraint on this, um, and then I'll be, then I'll be done. Um, we're going to do the same thing with paleomagnetism as we are doing with uh, the thermal chronology with the uranium, thorium, helium series. Um, and I think this one's sort of interesting because this is actually a fairly easy technique. Um, notion being here that if you place a stack of, of lava, lava flows, say, in a magnetic field, um, and then throw a dike in at some later time when the magnetic field had a different orientation, if that dike is hot enough, you will reset the magnetic directions in the same way that you reset the uranium thorium helium system, right? In some pattern that looks like this. Pretty cool. And so that's, of course, a much higher temperature. That's the Curie point, 580C. Those other ones are more like 180 for zircon and more like 70 degrees for appetite. So you can sort of now think of you have a whole bunch of temperature constraints in this system. Um, bigger the dike, the longer the thermal pulse the larger the reset zone. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so here's a dike coming through some lava flows. <laughs> and you can now go out and, and gather samples. Um, if it's in a wilderness area, you do not drill. You collect oriented samples. <laughs> uh, but that's fine. We can do that. We do not need drills. OK, so we can con uh, constrain the Curie point temperature here and play the same modeling games. So we did this at the Jackson Lake segment. And uh, the bottom line is that we can actually fit the models that we developed actually pretty well using the lower temperature constraints. So here's Jackson A. Um, these, uh, uh, let's see, what is it? Um, the gray curves is the model envelope for the paleomagnetic constraints. The blue curves is the model envelope for the low temperature uranium thorium helium or uranium, yeah, uranium thorium helium. Uh, constraints and then um, and and they they overlap I suppose I guess so that's that's the idea 
here. Um, pretty great. We get uh, lifetimes of, of, of roughly the same, same amount of time. Um, just to sort of wrap up here, we, we did this with uh, a few other feeder dikes in the, in the CRB. So um, here's that Maxwell Lake one, but we also did this, uh, some feeder dikes along the Grand Ronde River at that tunnel dike. I showed you a picture of also this um, Powaka Bridge dike. Um, this is Puffer Butte, actually, if anyone has been, been there, um, State Park, which is actually an old CRB event. Um, and we get a whole range of, of dike lifetimes using this technique. Um, and so this is, I think, a pretty outstanding way to sort of answer these questions of, of what's the spread in active durations of, of these events that happened 15 million years ago. Um, we can now sort of say at sort of precision down to sort of weeks, how long these things were active. Pretty cool. Um, okay, so the, the last question, I'm more just like leave, leave you with this, right, is so how similar are these eruptions, right, to, to um, the historical record is the picture from, from Kilauea 2018, um, right, like, can we make this analogy? Um, and, and I'll leave you with a couple of points, right, clearly the volumes are quite different. <laughs> and so that's the CRB 21 uh, or 210,000 uh, cubic kilometers versus one for the Kilauea eruption. Um, so that's that's a big difference. But, um, you know, are they the same mechanics, just different scales or different mechanics? Um, what can we say about the longevity and rate of these eruptions? And this is the thing that I'll, I'll leave you with is, is we've put together this compilation here where we've taken uh, a number of, of both historical examples, the CRB, these blue um, symbols, and the um, deckhand traps there another large igneous province and the green symbols. And what we've done is we've, we've tried to estimate, right? If I take different units, if I look at different scales, right? Um, there's a time scale associated with those, right? Like we could, for example, let's look at um, Hawaii. Uh, we can look at the lifetime of Kilauea volcano as a measure of eruption event on some scale. We can then compare to it, the Pu'u'o'o eruption. We can compare to that, the Kilauea 2018 eruption, and we're going at progressively smaller and smaller scales. And what we do if we see that is that the volcanic flux that you would get if you took the volume of that um, event, right, whatever it is, building a volcano or a single eruption, dividing it by the duration of that event, right, age of the volcano, age of the eruption, the volcanic flux gets higher and higher. The apparent volcanic flux, right, taking a larger volume and averaging it over a, over a smaller or a different, a different time window. Um, and so that's, that's what we did for Kilauea. You can do the same thing with the CRB, right? So here's the Graham Ron formation. You can look at the Wapshilla Ridge member of that. And then we can take our, our Maxwell Lake dike now and put that as a single unit point here at the top. And basically what that is telling us is that the eruption rates that you're getting both, you know, similarly to historic events, get bigger and bigger, the, sh the sort of more detailed in time you look. Um, but clearly there's big differences in the magnitude. Right? So in some sense, the scale is clearly distinct. Um, and so, you know, individual eruption rates are likely, likely about 10 times larger um, than our, uh, or a hundred times even than, than Kilauea, 10 times larger than Maki. Um, and so this thing sort of gives you a way maybe of putting these, these uh, eruptions in the geologic record into a historic context and asking what are the implications of them. Um, and so I think I'll just end with that, actually. Um, cognizant of the time here um, and, and ask for, for any questions. Yeah, but thanks for, thanks for having me. Um, hope to visit in person sometime. <laughs>